Uh, our second speaker for this session uh, is Maya Pontic, and this is very nice because complementing uh, Barbara's research focus on uh, human verbal behavior and its grounding in collaborative action uh, is uh, Maya Pantic's research focus on human nonverbal behavior and its applications to computer human interfaces. The kind of uh, human behavioral cues she's looking at are ones that you have to sense. They're facial expressions, body gestures, vocal gestures such as laughing. Uh, Maya got her PhD in computer science from Delft University of Technology uh, and then went on to join its faculty. Uh, in 2006, she came to the UK to join the Department of Computing at Imperial College, where she's now Professor of Affective and Behavioral Computing. In 2002, she received the Innovational Research Award, I'm sure it sounds better in Dutch, from the Dutch Research Council for Research on Facial Information for Advanced Interfaces, and then in 2007, a European Research Council starting grant for research on machine analysis of human natural behavior. Most recently, she received the annual uh, BCS Roger Needham Award. So Maya's talk today is entitled Machine Analysis of Facial Behavior. Maya, thank you so thank you. much for this beautiful introduction. It is indeed um, my pleasure to talk after Barbara because many of the questions that she raised um, in our research, at least we try partially to, to address mostly um, how you could analyze human behavior, right? So this talk is about machine analysis of facial behavior. And the first question that you could ask me is what this has to do with computer science. I mean, this has to do with psychology, human behavior, you know, human face. So you can, the face, the human face is really fascinating. You can use it for uh, a thousands of things. So you can, we actually use human face to identify under other members of our species. We also use the face to judge the age of a person or the gender of a person or the beauty of a person. We even use the face to judge the personality of a person. This goes back actually to the Aristotle time and whether this really is a correct assumption or not uh, remains arguable. So in principle, if you think what we could use the face for, um, you immediately come to thousands of applications. So first of all, the security applications, because you immediately talk about identity, so it's uh, access control and these kind of things, but also about other things, like, for example, medical purposes, and not that noble ones, as Kirsten was talking about, but, you know, things like uh, plastic surgery, right? So, in principle, what is more important, more fascinating for me, is that the face are our, is our preeminent means to actually recognize the emotions, the intentions, and the attitude of other people. So this goes back to this understanding of human behavior. Human face provides, actually, the means that we understand the human behavior, and then hopefully be able to use that further uh, for our computer. Computer games, or human-computer interaction, or whatever else we want to do with computers. So this is why I got really interested in um, facial behavior analysis, machine analysis of, of facial behavior, and doing it in a fully automatic way. So this dates back to 96 when I was doing my Master of Science thesis in Delft. At that time, whenever I said to somebody, what are you doing? I'm doing the automatic recognition of facial expressions. They would look at me like I'm totally crazy. That's like absolutely impossible, right? So um, some of the first techniques that we built were, in principle, very simple. We used um, classical image processing and computer vision techniques such as image histogramming and active contour tracking to reason about uh, basic emotions, prototypic expressions of basic emotions based on static images. 
So we would actually track these contours of uh, uh, the facial components like the eyebrows, the eyes, and the mouth, and then uh, use a set of rules that would say, well, if in correspondence to the expressionless face, the contours change in a certain manner, we would reason that this is a certain emotion. So in this case, if the contours of the eyes and the mouth uh, get smaller, you will actually reason that this is anger. So, uh, however, what's the problem is that when you come to the real world applications, uh, such as this one, this is a camera mounted on a robot and children, of course, playing uh, with it uh, because they can see what the robot is recording. Um, you come to a question whether these prototypic expressions of emotions, six basic emotions, which are the happiness, the anger, surprise, fear, disgust, and sadness, are useful at all. We actually do not show these uh, prototypic expressions in our everyday life. We show much more subtle expressions. That is the time that we decided not to go um, into the basic emotions recognition, but actually to concentrate on something else, which are the facial um, action units. So each of these facial actions are directly linked to facial muscle actions. So there is a very large muscle running across our forehead, and when you activate the middle portion of it, you will actually have the inner raised eyebrow raise. If you activate the outer portion of that muscle, you will have action unit two, which is the outer, uh, which is action unit two. If you do this, that will be action unit one plus action unit two. So there are in total 44 of those action units, and if you could recognize those 44 action units, you would be actually able to recognize each and every facial expression that we can possibly make. If you think that this is actually what you want to achieve in a video, to, eat, to, to actually label each and every frame in terms of those action units. What is the point is that we have something like 10,000 different facial expressions that we can express, 7,000 of which we express on a daily basis. So if you think about 44 action units that could be used to represent all those 7,000 or 10,000 expressions, the dimensionality reduction is actually huge. So this is what we wanted to achieve. The reason is that uh, why I wanted to go into the action units is that action units are completely agnostic. So you can use them to recognize basic expressions, like expression of sadness. Right? This is a prototypic facial expression of sadness. Everybody shows it. Everybody can show it. That's not the point. The point is that we rarely show it in a, in a daily, daily life. Uh, the fact that my son is showing it is just that he learned that this is the way to get whatever he wants, right? <laughs> OK. You can also code, in terms of these action units, any non-basic emotional display or any expression of attitude or any given facial expression. So what we wanted first is, OK, we had this system that we developed for the recognition of emotions, basic emotions, in frontal views. So we said, OK, we can use actually very similar techniques image processing techniques, contour tracking techniques, check the contours uh, of all the components that we are interested in, which are the eyebrows, the eyes, and the mouth, and then reason about different action units. The problem is that certain action units have very similar appearance, at least when you judge from static images from frontal views. So in case of this uh, girl, if you look at the right-hand side uh, picture, you cannot distinguish whether she is actually just has an open mouth or she has her job, which is protruding out. However, if you would use a profile view facial image, you will immediately cancel the possibility of action in 26. 
So this is the time where we went into the so-called uh, dual view uh, facial image analysis and applied uh, similar techniques to the ones that we applied previously, only at this point we also had a contour of the profile and then we reason about different action units rather than different basic emotions. So when I would say the eyes got more narrow, I would actually score action unit seven. And if I would say my lips or the lips went narrow, I would score action unit 24. And I will always check whether I have the same score in the frontal view and in the profile view. So actually I would have a kind of a merging of the rules, right? Well, this was uh, quite uh, amazing research in 1999 and 2000. The reason is that actually nobody else did, did this, right? However, uh, I mean, it was the very first uh, approach ever published in terms of uh, automatic f action unit detection. It was the very first one who dealt with the both views, frontal view and profile view, and so on and so forth. But, and many, many people uh, ap adopted these approaches for their own purposes. However, the problem with this is that not all action units could be recognized. This is one of the problems, and the reason is that actually some of the action units could cannot be represented in terms of movements of the points or changes in the contour of the facial components. Uh, a very good example is the dimple, which is uh, labeled as action unit 14, which is a very typical action unit in uh, contempt, in boredom, in irritation. So uh, in all or very many uh, real world expressions, and you can detect it actually only from the change in the appearance from this dimple, right? You cannot actually say that the shape is different than, for example, the shape that you get if your mouth is just stretched. You don't see the difference, right? Uh, another much more important uh, problem with this approach is that we handle only static images. So let me first start with the uh, second problem and show you this. So this is uh, on the left, uh, let me see, on the left hand side you have an expressionless face and on the right hand side you have an expressive face. C can you guess what is this expression? Anybody? Okay, this is a very typical uh, uh, answer and I completely agree. If you would look at this, this face, you would simply say, okay, his eyebrows are raised, his eyes appear to be more open, his lips are a little bit open. It is a typical surprise expression. However, if you look at the motion, you will immediately see that this has nothing to do with surprise. This is a typical way of greeting somebody or in this case, this is my Greek student of saying a Greek no, right? So it has nothing to do with surprise, okay? <laughs> so this is when we start, uh, started the research on uh, analysis of facial videos and actually including the dynamics of facial behavior into our analysis. So the classical approach was to detect the face in an input image, uh, detect a number of uh, characteristic facial points, and then uh, track these points in the whole video and reason about the motion of those points in terms of action units. So we did, and we still do, uh, a very, um, and very intensively the research on facial point tracking. So we de developed different uh, tracking techniques for tracking uh, facial points, and the one that you, are see, that you, that you see here is a, a, a rather old one. It uses particle filtering uh, framework, and it uh, uses the assumption that uh, all the points belonging to the same facial components, such as the eye, should have a specific constellation. So for example, a point of the eye, which is the inner corner of the eye, cannot go you know, to your uh, uh, forehead or something. So you learn these constellations based on your training examples. 
As you can see, the tracker works pretty fine and we could use it in many, many different uh, uh, occasions and uh, applications. The problem was, of course, that when we went to uh, uh, very spontaneous uh, data, like this data where uh, we asked people to watch different videos and we just recorded their reactions, you have the tracker which cannot deal with these constant uh, uh, motion that uh, humans tend to make, right, with their head. So we then developed a different uh, detector uh, which uh, uses an uh, incremental version of the robust kernel principal component analysis, the mouthful. Um, uh, you can imagine it as follows. We use a very specific uh, image descriptors, which in this case are orientations of image gradients, and we learn in each frame how the change in the appearance uh, uh, happens. So in each frame we adapt actually the model that we will track in the next, next frame. This is the reason why this uh, uh, tracker is much more stable. This is also the reason why this tracker can deal with some of the most difficult problems that we have currently in computer vision. And those are occlusions as well as very large changes in illumination, which are constant changes in illumination. So uh, the video which you see uh, on uh, the uh, right, uh, down or lower corner uh, is actually a video of a guy moving under the foliage. This is uh, a video made outside and this is extremely important if you want to build robots or any systems that will work actually in outdoor environments, okay? So this is the first and absolutely first such method that can deal with this kind of, uh, of situations. However, um, the, the, this tracker works uh, pretty well also in a very low resolution videos, uh, such as the videos, video uh, recorded in this uh, robot scenario where we just recorded people uh, uh, doing um, things in front of robot. But again, it does not work at all well with the uh, um, uh, large changes in the head pose or uh, with the uh, very many, um, uh, nods and shakes of the head. So there are improvements that we need to do. When it comes to facial expression classification, a very classical method was this that I already explained, where we used the positions or say the motions of the facial points to reason about the different action units. Uh, the first uh, approach that we applied was a frame-based uh, action unit classification approach where actually what we did was we tried for each frame to reason about a certain action unit, okay? However, what you get then, because these points are not tracked very uh, robustly, of course, is that you will have action units which are sometimes activated and immediately in the next frame deactivated. So you have this problem on, of on, off, on activation, which is of course impossible because facial muscles need time. The fastest activation of a facial muscle is one fifth of a second. So if you talk about 30 frames per second, uh, uh, temporal resolution of your video, this is six seconds. This is the minimal time needed for a, a facial muscle to get activated. If you talk about 60 frames per second, we talk about 10 frames, right? So it's absolutely impossible that you have on, off, on, off. So this is just an artifact of a bad tracking algorithm, right? So what, how to deal with that? We said, okay, let's forget about per frame. What we're gonna do, we will try actually to feed the results of per frame classifiers into the hidden Markov models and then build the temporal dynamics model, which will say, okay, my action unit should be first in onset, then in apex, and then in offset, which means it will get activated, it will come to a peak, and it will get disactivated, right? So this is what you, what you see here. Uh, uh, you look at the action uh, detector for the action unit 27, which is the jaw drop. The green line in the top graph is the onset class. The red line is the offset class. And 
Here, we feed that into the hidden Markov model and you see how smooth the results you get, where the green are the true labels and the red are the predicted labels in the lower graph. Okay. Um, except of dealing with this problem of temporal smoothing of the results, the Doing research on temporal dynamics and temporal evolution of action units has actually a lot of implications. Let me show you something. This is a video of two girls, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is entertained by a clown. The other was told to laugh, okay? Which one of those is entertained by a clown? Who would say it is this girl? Okay. Who would say it's the other one? Okay. The majority said it's the other one. This is a typical answer when you go to computer science or the technical background meeting, okay? <laughs> when you go to social background meeting, everybody says it's this girl. And they would be right, okay? <laughs> Let me explain why is this the case. <laughs> okay, so look at the blue points. Those are just the corners of the mouth, okay? Here you see the trace of, uh, of those points. What is happening with this girl is, okay, let me see, is this funny? Oh, yes, it's funny. Let me laugh a little bit more. This is a typical spontaneous laughter. It has multiple apexes. We think whether this is funny what we see, and then we laugh a little bit more. However, if you look at the other girl, what happened? They said to her, laugh. Okay, laugh. Laugh, 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 laugh. Now it's enough. Poof. Okay? <laughs> so this is exactly where you see a very fast onset and a very fast offset. Okay? So this is extremely important if we can di discover the dynamics of facial behavior. What we are actually able to do is to distinguish between acted laughter, or acted smiles, and a genuine one, or between anticipatory pain and the genuine pain, <laughs> or, in fact, between deceit and veracity. Okay? So it's very interesting, and that's why uh, the rest of our research from, say, 2005 on is, uh, say, focused on the analysis of the dynamics of facial behavior. So we developed uh, um, different methods. Uh, one of those is based on, again, the tracking of the facial points in the uh, frontal views and reasoning uh, on the movements of those points, of course, in correspondence to the position of the points in an expressionless face, which you usually capture in some of the first frames of the video, because when you start recording people, they don't laugh immediately like crazy. They just, uh, or do whatever, they just to watch the camera. So you get this neutral or expressionless face. We also, uh, developed a, a different, a similar, but yet a different method uh, which uh, will do the event-based uh, uh, reasoning on, um, on the whole uh, sequence, which will take uh, the whole action unit into account and then reason about this onset, apex, and offset, and give that as the output for the whole sequence. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, also with completely different method, which is also motion based, but it does not take the points as such into account. What it takes into account is the motion in the facial region. So what we do, we uh, we put a grid of points over the face, uh, over the facial region, and we calculate uh, the motion. We, you can do that uh, using optical flow, for example, and then you reason what is the difference between uh, the successive frames, okay? And you see the difference on a frame by frame basis in the top graph. What you see down is the sum of the frame by frame uh, deformation, and then here we use the, just the first frame and we applied this summed motion to the first frame. 
So to synthesize the video and see whether the synthesized video resembles the original video. And it does, but of course you have the artifact, there are no teeth because you don't see the teeth in the first frame, right? Okay, the methodology behind is uh, ensemble learning classifier, uh, doing classification based on the features such as the amplitude of the motion, the divergence and the curl, um, uh, taking into uh, in a frame by frame uh, fashion and then feeding that into the hidden Markov models that actually are Bayesian models that you can think as a temporal smoothers. Okay. The latest work uh, uh, that, uh, that we concentrated uh, on as well, among other things, was uh, to actually try to predict uh, the valence and arousal in continuous space. So rather than having the discrete emotions such as uh, disgust, happiness, sadness, uh, anger, fear, and surprise, we would actually try to recognize uh, the affect, uh, affect the dimensions such as valence and arousal. Arousal says something about how, how person is excited and valence is how positive or negative a certain reaction is, okay? Of course, when we talk about uh, human behavior understanding, having only arousal and valence is not enough. I mean, that's obvious. But you can always add another dimension. So you can add things like dominance, uh, which is a very classical personality trait, you can also add other traits like, for example, introvertness and extrovertness, which are all closely linked with things like valence and arousal, or you can actually treat any other uh, phenomena that you are interested in, such as stress or pain, as a dimension. So the whole idea is not to discretize the space, because we don't show the discrete expressions. It is you have to go through a phase, right? So you have to show this laughter or you have to show the throw, right? You don't just show it. It's impossible, right? There is, a, there is a time development of this expression. So it is a continuous thing. And what we do, we just simply, actually in machine vision uh, community, we just actually deal with this end product of, uh, of facial behavior, which is obviously wrong. So we try to remedy that and deal with continuous analysis of emotions. So in order to uh, con uh, estimate on a continuous uh, time scale, the valence and arousal uh, in spontaneous uh, facial uh, behavior, we developed a completely novel method, uh, which is output associative relevance vector uh, regression, which um, uh, takes into account uh, the movements of the points, but not in the current frame, but in a number of frames surrounding the current frame. And then reasoning about giving the prediction about uh, the valence and arousal. So whenever I talk about continuous, that means regression. It does not mean any more classification in terms of machine learning. The results that we got are impressive. Uh, the reason is that we actually uh, trained the whole system only on a single subject and tested it on a number of subjects. And the results are still really, really good. What you see here are actually the error rates. So having an error rate of 0, 1 or 0, 2 is really good. So I talked today about a number of techniques which we developed. Um, some of these problems, such as, for example, facial expression recognition in static face images, are considered solved. Some other problems, such as tracking, are not considered solved, and it is a question when they will be solved. So what you see, for example, down, uh, this is uh, our active appearance uh, model that we developed, which, as you can see, deals extremely well with fast motion and with large changes in the head pose, but it cannot deal at all with uh, changes il in illumination. So what we need to do is combine the method that we have, a kernel method that we have, uh, up and the method for active appearance models in order to get. So this is one of our current researches. We also worked on a number of other problems. Uh, we are actually the very first ones who 
uh, deal with this problem. The, the um, method that I just described for valence and arousal um, prediction in continuous video is the only such method existing nowadays. Another method on which we work is uh, the method um, that actually does not use the static faces for person identification. It uses the dynamics of the face to identify the people. And there are only a few works in psychology that say that this is possible. This is actually the first attempt to do this automatically, and we get really good results. So it, it is really interesting to go further into this research and see how the behavior distinguishes between people. Why I'm so interested in that is because, okay, I have a child, my child is very curious, he wants to actually open all possible and impossible applications of my, on my computer, so some of the things maybe should be protected, right? So if I could have this kind of constant control, which is not based on a, on a, on a face, because he's extremely smart, he would take my picture and put it in front of the camera, right? So, so the point is that you have to, to, to trick them somehow. So this would be one way of doing that. Uh, another line of research uh, uh, which we started is uh, using 3D uh, videos. Actually, those are the uh, videos recorded by 3D camera. So you have actually uh, a depth uh, information, but over time, okay? So why is this of importance is because certain areas, such as these areas around the jaw, are extremely important for, for example, detection of stress. But we cannot reason at all uh, what is going on there because we don't see, definitely not from the point. Also not actually for anything what is frontal view and appearance-based model. So this is why this is actually interesting. The method itself is exactly the same as the one I already described to you, which uses the grid of the overlay points. We only now have the grid of the points in the 3D, and we have a number of uh, uh, projections uh, that we use for the analysis of, uh, in this case, expressions, six basic. Another interesting part, which I actually believe is pushing the borders further and answering a lot of questions in uh, not only computer science, it actually answers some of the questions in behavioral sciences and psychology as well, is uh, the studies or interpersonal interactions. What was the problem with these studies is that uh, people did not have time and, I don't know, nerve uh, uh, and, uh, I don't know, persistence to sit and find a way to uh, synchronize all the sensors that you use for recordings, synchronize it to very high precision, which is absolutely necessary if you want to study things such as mimicry. Mimicry is extremely important. The way we mimic each other says something about the rap, uh, report. Uh, it is all says something also about uh, the, uh, for example, whether we like somebody, whether we dislike somebody. It says something about flirting, it says something about who is the boss and who is the um, employee, right? Because bosses tend not to mimic, and employees tend to mimic in order to be uh, liked. So these things happen unconsciously, okay? But they are extremely important because if we can analyze these kind of things, we could actually understand much more of what is going on, what is the human behavior. Things what I said unconsciously, this is extremely important as well. Think about when you go into the bus, you sit by somebody, but you will, there are two empty places. You will sit on one of them. You make a lot of processing in your brain where you will sit. This depends on who is the person next to one side, who is the person on the other side, whether this is closed by the door, thousands of decisions. This happens unconsciously 30 milliseconds, okay? If we, could be, if we would be able to analyze these kind of things automatically, we would actually be able maybe to open some of those doors, how our brain function, how we, how we function, okay? So what are the lessons learned? The first one is that we should not work with active expressions. This, uh, Unfortunately, still, 85% of computer vision community work 
uh, works with uh, acted expressions. However, acted expressions are person independent, they're extremely exaggerated, and uh, they're short-lived. However, if you deal with spontaneous expressions, you have very subtle changes in the behavior, plus these are person dependent, okay? So if you train your methods on active behavior, they will not work on spontaneous behavior, okay? First of all, due to subtlety. Second, because of the person dependence. The second thing is uh, the dynamics of the behavior are extremely important. As I said, the, my group is still one of the very few groups who deal with this problem. There are problems with this. I mean, one of the things is having a good data set for that. So we develop the data set. It's publicly available currently. However, there is also a lot of machine learning uh, behind. So of course, maybe that's a problem. However, I believe this is the cue. So this is what we should do. The third and uh, very important uh, 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 lesson is that actually we should not discretize the space which is originally continuous. Behavior is a continuous phenomenon. Discretization in any way is not a good, good thing. So it's much better if you work with continuous dim uh, dimensional, multidimensional interpretations. And the last thing is exactly as many people also remarked so far, there are no excellent work without excellent people. So I'm really grateful to my group because the work which I presented is due to them. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Are there questions for Maya? Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I had two questions. Uh, the first one was about spontaneity, which is the uh, point right at the top. Um, absolutely, the direction you're going seems to be incredibly promising. I wondered about lying, because even in spontaneous behavior, where do the, if you have lies, where do they come from? So if somebody's instructed to lie and then behave spontaneously, it's not a real lie. So you want spontaneous lies in the spontaneous behavior. So that was question number one. It was just a question about how you get that fantastic data that you're getting in the spontaneous data sets. And the second question was, you alluded to going to 3D, and I wondered whether you'd also looked at uh, going into infrared if you're adding dimensions to the data set. Thanks. So regarding the, the lies, the way we do is uh, we actually give the choice to people either to lie or not to lie. It's up to them. If they lie and uh, they pursue the interviewer that they are telling the truth, they are getting the reward. If they are caught, they don't get the reward. Okay. So they have, it's very important that you work with incentive. This is very sensitive topic. So it is, if you do not have a good incentive, you will not get the good data. However, the data that we are releasing is not about the lies. It is the data about, um, in fact, we wanted to have conflict data. We never managed to have conflict data because what we did stupidly, that was really my mistake, is that, in fact, we brought people who did not know each other. So of course they wanted to like each other. So it's the data at the end, we call it a mimicry database because they only mimic each other instead of having a conflict, okay? So this is, uh, this is but it's a fully spontaneous data. We didn't, we just told them one should persuade the other to give him the room because they were like flatmates trying to, you know, get a new flatmate, right? That was about that. Infrared, um, well, I worked uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the thermal do domain. It is a very interesting domain. It is different than infrared, but uh, it can give you uh, uh, interesting um, uh, data and information. However, the problem is that the current commercially available cameras, 
uh, for thermal uh, acquisition are first very expensive, second they're really bad. So uh, what you need, what, what, what happened is that I, I, I was very lucky that I have some people in the States who again have very good connections with the army. So we got to use a thermal camera of some $300,000 uh, in order to record some of the thermal data. And you can definitely see, for example, when people lie that uh, uh, they flash. So this you can see, but you really need this kind of camera and this kind of cameras cannot be uh, bought, you know, commercially. So that's a little bit of a problem. I hope I answered. I think the third part was 3, 3D was the third part? Uh, yeah, that, that was just another dimension. Ah. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is also about the um, naturalistic behavior. So I, I completely understand from your examples why you wanted naturalistic behavior. But I'm wondering what you do about the logical problem that if you're trying to get naturalistic behavior to be a training set for facial recognition, if it's naturalistic, so you haven't told somebody, be happy, be sad, how do you, how do you know without falling into a sort of logical loop that you're correctly identifying the expressions you're seeing in order to use them in the training set? So how it goes is uh, when you're working with simple things such as happiness, uh, you simply give people to watch funny videos. This is, uh, uh, and they laugh. So this is, uh, this is a simple way. However, if you want more complex data, like the data I showed, this is the main data, you have, of course, the problem. So at that point, what we do, we give to psychologists to uh, annotate uh, valence and arousal because they are trained to annotate valence and arousal. However, again, we have a problem because each and every person has his or her own opinion of what is valence and what is arousal and how they should score it, okay? So although they are trained, they still have a lot of uh, uh, divergence in between them. So you have to ask many of them to do that. There is a third problem, and that is the delay between the brain and how you annotate, okay? So some people, for some people, take it a shorter period of time to annotate valence and arousal, or whatever dimension you want them to annotate, than for the other people. So you have to take that into account. So actually what we do, we first have for each sequence uh, a, a so-called uh, calibration moment where we first measure what is the delay that people will have between the, the process uh, and give the answer of valence and arousal, and then we actually apply that for the whole sequence. The first problem of having the divergence between people, we solved in a very fancy manner, and that is we developed a, a novel probabilistic dynamic version of uh, correlation, component correlation analysis, which uh, actually when you apply, you get the alignment of uh, the time series because you can uh, see actually the, the annotation as a time series. So we have the alignment of time series, time wrapping of the time series, and so we get the ground truth from 15, 16, 20 annotators. So it's quite good. Thank you. Okay, one final question, Graham. At the moment, some psychologists in their laboratories, when they're trying to give stimuli to human subjects and see how they react, they have to spend ages hand coding videos for the facial expressions in the reactions to see what the reactions have been. Is this technology something that could be used in a psychology lab robustly to replace that? This, is the, this is the whole point. So um, we actually developed a number of uh, tools which are all available from my website. So if you are interested in this, just go, to, you, you can Google iBug or my name and you will come to the website and you can download, we release all of our tools. So search for action unit annotation. Uh, of course, you will need uh, to track the points. We give also the trackers. So the ones for action units, you have appearance base, which work on LBPs, and for relatively frontal views, LBPs are uh, uh, local binary patterns. This is appearance-based features. Uh, all appearance-based features suffer from changes in the head position. So if you have nearly frontal views, it will give you pretty good results in terms of action units, okay? So we do release the code. So uh, the technology is currently available 
uh, for, for that. And we collaborate with both Jeffrey Cohn, uh, uh, who is one of the known psychologists in uh, University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, as well as with Judy Bourgon, who is uh, working in University of Arizona on lie detection, as well as with Roddy Covey and others in UK. Rather than ask for other questions, I think we'll thank both speakers and go enjoy some tea. <laughs>